Opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go Under the Hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. We are glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Hey, thanks for joining us Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. Do you wait until I start to move your microphone? Lately, that's been a habit that I should get out of, isn't it? (laughs) I start, point to you, here we go, and then you quick make the move. I maybe have more new, more nervous twitches than I want to admit. <laughs> Let's talk to Ray. Ray's been on hold here for a little while, waiting. I talked to him just a little bit ago, but I want to get him on the air as soon as we can. Ray, you're on the End of the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Oh, this is Frank. Frank, go ahead. Sorry, Frank. Yeah. I thought you said Ray. No, that's all right. <laughs> that's not even close. Sorry, not even close. Team, little... <laughs> no, I'm a little hoarse because I'm calling you all from a Vera hospital oh. here in Sioux Falls, and I just remember a little... I listen to y'all guys on Saturday when I'm feeding cattle at the field out in Northwest Iowa. Okay. And um, I remember y'all said, this is what y'all do live. And I'm like, well, I'm in the hospital. I wonder if I can get in. And thank you. And I just want to say, guys, y'all are awesome. And y'all don't realize how many people y'all actually help financially. Because there are a lot of people who can't afford mechanics. And everything being so expensive, the services that y'all give on the road and the radio, they're not only entertaining, but it's very uh, helpful. So thank you so much for what y'all do. Well, thank and you very my much. My question is, you're welcome. No, thank you. Um, my question is, I actually have two. I'm a Dodge guy. They're simple to work on. And, you know, they'll have their little corks, but they'll last forever. I have a Dodge 2006 Dodge Durango. And all of a sudden, off and on, my emergency light brake will kind of pop on. And so I would tinker pulling it while I'm driving and then I'll push, I'll put my, my foot behind the pedal and push up and it'll go off. Well, and it'd be fine. Well, now they'll pop on and all of a sudden all my electrical components start, uh, kind of freaking out, shutting on, shutting off, radio comes on, comes off. So the first thing that popped in my mind is maybe something with the emergency brake. So I start pushing it back on goes away but now it's doing it pretty consistent and a gentleman uh, told me a friend says put a twisty tie on there tie it up to the little frame there what's happening is your brake emergency brake pedal is sliding down and it's causing that well even with the twisty tie now it still does it here and there and it's almost like the vehicle's going to die what's um Brake fluid switch. How much brake fluid do you got in there? Is it full to the max line on the reservoir? Have you looked at that? Because if it's just a tiny bit you know, under, it'll turn that light on. There's a switch in there that's uh, for fluid okay. level. If it gets too low, it'll turn the red light on. Same red light as the emergency brake. It is. Okay. Yep. And I checked that, and it was under the max level, and I put them in there. But then I got thinking, you know what? Even though I put new in there, I probably should drain it and then put all new in there because it's kind of old. It looks really dark and dirty it's not clear anymore that could be okay okay but that well, then but, I'll, but I'll I'll i want to go but i do want to go back to what you said though are you getting lights that are related to any system that's not brake related because if it's brake related it could be traction control it could be um analog brakes it could be a number of things that are you know if it's a fancy enough model they've got sensors for for uh, yaw, for whether the vehicle shifts and, you know, all that good stuff. You said you had a series of lights. Were they, what were, do you remember what they all were? Yeah, they were basically all the lights. One of the first ones would be the emergency brake light. Then there was a detraction control where it shows like the vehicle sliding. And then, but during that, everything comes on and my uh, odometer uh, fingers, they both start going down like they're, like the vehicle's going to die. And the radio pops on and off. It just it just starts clicking. It just click, 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 
and everything is moving simultaneously going off and on. And the vehicle has not died per se, but it, it still runs great, but the electrical, everything is, it is, is flashing and, and going crazy. So what, remind uh, me what year, what, remind me what year this is again. It's a 2006 Dodge Durango 5.7 uh, Hemi. Hemi. Oh. Well, okay. We'll well, it's new enough to have some pretty sophisticated systems, but old enough yet that it's still somewhat simplistic compared to the if it was a 2012 right. uh, type unit. Because the 2006 is still the older generation, I believe, of that Durango. Mm-hmm. I'm a, I think I would be doing a good inspection of your your battery power wires, your ground connections. Um, and doing all that stuff because it sounds to me that you might also be dealing with a situation on on a on a power issue uh, with the way that okay. you're describing that, and without having to okay. start replacing any parts, you know. Of course, we I think you're on the on the on the trail of your brake issue, but as far okay. as this other stuff with your cluster needles dropping and starting to click and that sort of thing, we, let's start off with a good power inspection. Batteries, ground, Russ. Is there any on those six Durango? Is there any? Is there any tricky grounds that you guys see often not in good shape? That main battery ground has has been a problem on those for quite some time. The one there's two of them there. You got one going to the engine. That's your main one for your starting system, and then there's a smaller ground leading off of that cable. And we've had some issues with that not grounding well. They get corroded. And then maybe it's you know, okay. like so. Maybe the circuits are searching for ground in a different place. So. Let's start with that, and then we'll okay. we'll, we'll see okay. if we can we see if we can get you better and out of the hospital, and see if we can get your Durango better. Hey guys, y'all made my day because I'm in here for back pain, and y'all if y'all ever know what that's like, I don't wish it on anybody. But real quick, if you don't mind, I have another issue with my go to the farm vehicle. It's a little PT Cruiser. It's a 2004 Turbo Limited, uh, 2.4. My buddies again are telling me, he goes, maybe it's just your belt. It's whistling really bad. It's not the water pump because there's no leakage or anything. And so I was just going to replace the two belts, the one in the pulley and then the alternator. But I got the alternator tested at a dealer, at a auto parts store. And he says, your alternator is fine. But what happens is my engine light is, it's an old car, just to go out to the farm. It stays on. But. No sooner I turn it on or I'm idling somewhere, it's like it's not getting enough power. It whistles. Uh, and I don't know if it's the bearings maybe from the alternator, but uh, it has a very high whistle. And uh, when I'm idling, the light starts coming on. The vehicle won't stop or anything, but the, uh, the engine light flashes. No sooner I start accelerating and get in it, I start accelerating, get up to 30, whatever, Obviously, getting the belt, everything moving quicker, it goes away. That could be your alternator failing, and that whistle could be that, but also the whistle could be the belt slipping. We replaced a lot of belts and tensioners on those vehicles. They actually had an update and a service bulletin from the manufacturer because of that belts slipping on those. They didn't have enough tension at idle. So if you look at it and you see that that tensioner is just kind of flopping around there and it's not holding that belt real tight, that could be what's going on. It's just slipping around that pulley at idle because the alternator needs, it actually puts a lot of load. It draws some horsepower trying to charge that battery, and especially under times of the fan running on the engine or the blower inside on or wipers on, it'll it'll drag and it'll squeak. Frank, thanks very much for the call. Good luck on uh, both issues, and yeah, get, get better soon. And but- I was thinking that earlier in that call, he said he liked Dodges because they're easy to work on. <laughs> that... I loved the beginning of that where he said, I like Dodges because they're easy to work on, but they run forever. And I thought, there's a substantial portion of our listenership right now chuckling to themselves or shaking their head. It all depends on what your brand preference and, is. And plenty of others going, yeah, yeah, no, But he's I'm right. guessing he's had these two vehicles for a long time, Uh huh. and they're, they're hanging in there. Now he's just trying to get them to the next step. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. What has caught your guys' attention since we last met? You know... 
I was looking at the most recent edition of one of the big publications, and they were showing future cars and what they might look at, look like, and they were showing many of them are electrified, many of them are still internal combustion engines. Um, they showed a a Corvette Sport Utility that they're that they're showing a concept. So there's all this stuff going on. But at the beginning of the article, they were talking about the new head of Toyota, and maybe, is he a Toyota? May, I, I don't remember the name. Or he is not. Chris okay. probably read the article too, possibly. I did. Mm-hmm. And when you, if you're wondering what I'm meaning by that, the, the name, for those of you who don't know, Toyota is a person's name. But the Toyota was that was wrong. the head of Toyota. Yeah. 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 Spelled he, different. He spelled it T O Y O D A. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I guess the, the thing that I got out of that article was that right now, Toyota only has one fully electric vehicle on their global platform mm-hmm. um well, they're hydrogen people aren't they well they've got they've got their hybrids and they're all in on hybrids they have been obviously from the beginning with the prius success story um one of them you know sitting right in the room here mm-hmm. but they are on their charts to make internal combustion engines along with hybrids till at least 2050 i think it said mm-hmm. and they are looking at other technologies and they have been slow to get onto the electric Highway. They nailed it out of the park when they hit the hybrid market. So if they wait long enough, they can let everybody else make the mistakes on the electrics. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But it was just pretty pointed that they're just not moving as fast on this stuff. Which they insinuated in the article, or maybe not. Not that that's not the right way. They one of the reasons, or one of the reason this guy was selected to take over was because he'd already been working on the electrification of Lexus. He was involved in that. So he is moving into the main spot because they've, they felt that they needed some catch up on the electric, all electric. So that was interesting. So, so they're, they may not be doing it now. Cause like I said, the previous chairman was definitely, he was out on the racetrack racing, uh, uh, an internal combustion engine that was converted to hydrogen to run on hydrogen. And he's been doing many things in a sense to, to go against the electrification push. And so I think like this chairman, they're saying, let's keep our mind open Mm -hmm. about what's coming because of the new government regulations here in North America, uh, in other countries, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see how they follow uh, the European Union ha- has had some pretty strong decrees, but they have stepped away from some of those. I know Senator Manchin just came out this week, and he said he goes, I, and he's you know on the Democratic side of things. You can get into the politics. I don't want to, but he came out and said, hey, we're moving too fast on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys are using this electric vehicle thing kind of as a Trojan horse, is what he said. Um, and uh, you know, so there's going to be this noise for a while as the whole thing goes. But the whole, the point is, is just. There's a lot of people that still have a lot of different ideas. And so just because one thing is being told to go this way doesn't mean that's the way we're going to end up tomorrow. I mm-hmm. I like the way you referenced it best, Shannon, when you said, even if the whole world, every one of us decided today, 100%, we all want electric cars and we want to go away from gasoline. So we're just going to stop. We're all okay with it. We're You can take my car or whatever. We're just going to turn it into electric. It can't be done because we can't. When you look the at produ- the number the production of, capacities right, out there, when we look at the number of gasoline cars we make today, if we could magically, magically, you know, flip the switch and snap our fingers and turn that into electric production instead of gas, we we just, it couldn't replace it. It would take like it was, 15, 20 years. Yeah, to our catch fleet, up our, our worldwide fleet is, I don't know, it's in, so the, in the hundreds of millions. It'll be a <laughs> gradual switch, no matter how fast they try to do it. Plus the infrastructure to produce electric vehicles is not as established as the infrastructure right. to build the, the ice vehicles. That's mm-hmm. still all being, those It'll frontiers are still being plowed. We get there. I wonder <laughs> if people look back on our show in 30 years, if somebody catches an old rerun of this and go, where do those guys, oh, they've been dead for decades. <laughs> you know, I, like, I wonder if they got it right. I want to go back and listen to a show from like 2007 or 2010. I do that now and then. Where callers oh are saying, I, I don't want an SUV. They, they'll never stop making cars because I don't need an SUV. I think this this SUV thing is overblown or whatever. We it, do and have our those. own. Yeah, our same and us doing the same thing. I just think it's. And then 
when we change our mind, eventually, as we all do throughout life, we we don't believe that we ever could see a, that we didn't believe that back then. I was just having a conversation with my brother about this. We were arguing about something ridiculous, like which Boston album was the better album. <laughs> And I remember for a fact Third stage. that we switched, I think we switched side, and that was my point. I said, hey, uh, remember we had this argument a long time ago, and you said this? I agree with you now. And he was like, I never said that. <laughs> so but then we yes, said you did. Yeah, <laughs> unless I'm wrong. But yeah, it was, I mean, I didn't tell him that. I never said that last part to him, yeah. but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I think back, it wasn't that long ago, we were talking about Ford, you know, kind of taking their cars out of their fleet for the most part. And mm-hmm. it's, yeah, there's a lot has changed. 866-594-4150. And when people were dumping SUVs upside down to get out of the SUV because gas went up in 08 or, you know, it's just interesting. Yeah, it is. Let's talk to David. You're on the Under the Hood Show. David, what can we do for you? Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I've got a 1963 Impala SS and wondering if I could uh, convert it to a battery-operated no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, we were both like trying to figure out how are we going to respond to this. GM's got the the electric thing. They right? do make they do make an e crate engine. I don't know. Don't. But don't why don't, would you want to do on, that? Stop. No, I'm stop. just telling you they do make. I'm it. just I, saying don't. I was, don't. I was teasing, gentlemen. I, was I hope so. Your conversation. Yeah, agreed. No. I don't want you to say anything or just let's move on from that before we all get in trouble. David, yeah, thanks for starting it. it. All right, David. Now let's ask <laughs> a, your real question. It's a, it's a 327 with a power glide. And the neutral safety switch uh, is keeping me from starting the engine. So I started looking online, and I found two places, and I can't remember the, the parts company, but they're $570 for a neutral safety switch. Make your own. And I thought, well, I just thought that was ridiculous because I saw the, the column mounts are 25 to $30. But this has to be mounted in the floor shifter because it's on the floor because it's an SS. So you're saying to devise my own? Make your own. Yeah. Just get yourself a high current switch, put it in there so that when it's in park, it'll start. It's not going to start in neutral as well, but it'll start when it's in park all the way up. And then... Use that. Use that for your neutral safety switch. Don't spend 500 bucks for it. Or either that or buy yourself an aftermarket shifter that has a switch built into it. You know, they, they can they well, make they, lots of them that way. They sell power glide shifters that have the uh, switch in, inside. Yes. It's actually a three-speed, four-speed, or power glide. You have to adjust it when you put it together in there, but they make the... I think it's low car that makes that. We bought one for our old 49 GMC came with a neutral safety switch and it was adjustable from a power glide to a six speed, depending on which gate you put it in how, when you put it in the truck. Okay. I was just going to ask, how do you adjust it? Yeah. It just has a little bar that comes in it, but that one actually will start in neutral or park. It's got a double switch in there, the way it's set up. And that's the way I'd go. Okay. If you got to spend 500 bucks, get something cool. Unless the car, yeah. unless oh. the car is a complete classic and you want to keep it original, then you'd have to. Well, you know, it's not a. It, it, it's got custom wheels and it's got uh, a high rise and a, a bigger carburetor and a little bit of a cam. But you know, I just I, I couldn't believe it that when I saw it was five hundred and seventy dollars, I just it floored me. Yep, it's that way because Delco. it can. Yeah, I went to Delco and of course they say it, it's it's uh, no longer made, which I can understand. Sixty three. But anyway, I'll make. I'll, I'll, I'm going to go on low car and see what they have to offer. Yeah. Thanks very much for the call. How do you put your own in? What do you do there? Well, you just take the console out, unbolt your shifter, unhook the cable, bolt the low car or whatever brand you put in there, put it back together. That's it, and it's good to go. And then you wire it into your neutral safety switch. It'll have a backup light switch built into that shifter as well, so you can have the backup lights work. You said that very, very casually. What's that? that process i just thought about it because it hit me with our 49 when i said make your own and then i thought i was making my own in the 49 and scott piper down here one of our sales guys said why don't you just buy a low car shifter and i went huh okay and i looked it up and down we got one
But your your casual was like he made it sound so yeah. easy. Yes, yeah. It really is. You could do it easily, Chris. You'd pull out that instruction, go four bolts, a clip, pull the cable out. What should I charge David for that? A lot. Okay. I'm in. 570 bucks. <laughs> Let's see if I can get it. Yeah. 498. <laughs> We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. Prepare to learn something. You're going under the hood. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. If you subscribe on our YouTube channel and you join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Jackson Smith. Congratulations from our friends over at Universal Technical Institute and all of us here at Under the Hood. Universal Technical Institute. Check them out online, Mm uti.edu. You can learn about mechanical stuff. You can learn about airplane stuff, boat stuff, marine mechanics, welding, CNC machining. That CNC stuff is pretty cool. I was just online pulling down a program so I could do some designing with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was neat. You can find programs from, you know, free, which are pretty much crap, uh, all the way up to thousands of dollars per month for rental of these things to get into programs but they're uh you get what you pay for them they're pretty cool but they'll teach you how to use programs like that as a professional in a business i was talking to a guy the other day about uh some musical instrument stuff and he has a big giant cnc machine in his for like guitars yeah in his house he has a big huge giant in his workshop and he makes guitar parts it's pretty neat i was trying to come up with stuff for him to make for me just like oh can you he's like well i I mean, yeah, I could. <laughs> could you make this? Cha-ching, I sure. can. <laughs> yeah. How much? Cha-ching. Yeah. Oh, and two of those? Mm-hmm. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Mm-hmm. And one more, cha-ching. just in case you... you so I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to go forth with that business proposition. I, I think I'll... You're good at asking questions, <laughs> though. <laughs> I got a lot of ideas. <laughs> 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Tracy. You're on the end of the Hood Show. Tracy, what can we do for you? Thank you. Well, first, a while back, Stan asked me what my goals were for this vehicle, and I just never <laughs> answered him. 400,000 miles, or I have two years left in my contract with the post office, so it's, it's either got to make one of those two things. Okay. It should culminate at approximately the same time. Okay. Well, Tracy, so we got a... five CRV. <laughs> oh, he, I, uh, your I cell phone is... Go ahead. Yeah, I just say we've got a customer of ours that yep. makes a run from here to Montana every day that has over 500,000 on his CRV and the motor is untouched. It's had one set of spark plugs in it. That's how untouched it is. So you're, you, you've got hopes. Wow. You got hopes. Oh yeah. All right, Tracy, try again. Your uh, cell is uh, iffy there. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Now we can go ahead. Okay. So my 05 CRV if I'm on a highway going around a long, sweeping right-hand corner, there will be these cracks going all the way across the road. When I hit one of those cracks, it feels like someone is pushing the rear end sideways just real quickly. It, it takes a jog to the side. Very disconcerting on slick roads. I look at all the sus- suspension bushings. I can't see anything wrong. They all seem to be centered. I don't see anything ripped. And there's no packing going on. So what's the problem? Have you looked at your tire wear? Is it any different than normal? Do you have any tread left? It's absolutely perfect. Okay. I think your vehicle's out of alignment. If everything is perfect, your bushings are all tight. You don't find anything loose in there. The wheel bearings are tight. The tires look good. I think it's just out of alignment. So what's happening is as the suspension moves up and down, it doesn't maintain its geometry because it's out a little bit we have that problem here where we're at you could drive along on a dry road straight and you're fine but if you're driving on that road and it's slippery out heavy rain ice on the road and you hit a little bump you can be all over the place and it's just an alignment issue wonder wonderful four-wheel alignment on those okay before i have Okay, before I have it aligned, should I put on some of those adjustable upper control arms or just keep the stock ones on it? Well, cost-wise, I'd say no, 
if we knew they could align it. But here's a two-edged sword because if if you get it onto that alignment rack and they try to align it and they can't because it needs those, they're either going to, you know, A, want you to put them on right there and that's going to be expensive or B, charge you for that alignment, send you away, you do them yourself, right. you come back and you pay for the alignment again. So Which is gonna, exactly what he's asking right there. So if yeah. you're going to keep this a long time, they're probably, if they're not loose, they're probably pretty worn and getting ready to be loose. I'd probably say, yeah, go ahead and replace them. So you've got something adjustable and then they, there's no excuse for them to say, well, it's, cl- it's real close. It's right on the edge. We can't align it anymore because it needs these and you've got them. And then you don't have to worry about that part wearing later. Does that help you out there, Tracy? Perfect. Thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Russ, I want to go back to this customer of yours. They do what run every day? They drive, you know who they are. But yeah. I, okay, well, for- their name is Bisson. They've okay. got a, a company that, that hauls, uh, animal product fluids <laughs> yes uh, and they they have a business of it and they they drive from here to several different states and they have runs that go out and they've got uh, we have a fleet of vehicles we actually change the oil in all of these vehicles once a week they're, that's how much they're wow. put and they're not they're, they're not like 3,000 miles they're they're like I think 6200 miles on the oil changes when they're coming in Every week. Yeah, that's nuts. These are newer CRVs, and they've they've, got a lot of miles. But they've went 500,000 miles. Mm -hmm. We've got one with like 450 on it now. The lowest one's a Tahoe. That's one of their V8 ones, and it's got 390 on it. Um, So 450, 500, 545, I think, on one of them. So it really does not prove, but at least supports the theory of when you get out and Highway. highway miles, warmed up, keep it running. That stuff's going to go a long time. And you could stretch out that oil change interval at that point too because of the way you're using it. I had a gentleman ask us on YouTube. So you can go to our YouTube channel and comment and ask questions about what you heard in a previous show. Just go there. There's a timeline shows when the call is. Go to that and then just make a comment on it. And their question was, what is a short trip? Because we said, well, if you're driving short trips, well, that's pretty vague, right? A short trip is any trip in which the engine doesn't have time to fully warm up and stay that way for probably at least 20 minutes. Because when the oil and the coolant reach full operating temperature and maintain that for about 20 minutes, it has enough time to burn off all the moisture and contaminants that can be burned off out of the oil. So the engine will last longer doing that. Short trips where you start it up, turn it off, you build condensation. And therefore, those things start to stick on the inside of the engine and cause restrictions in oil passages and stuff like that. That's a short trip. I have been, take, I took 10 minutes out of my life based on a conversation I was having on one of our board calls for the trade association. And it was a, I was actually getting on for another company's board call to give them information. and and receive. I wasn't just giving. (laughs) And when they got on, they were doing small talk, waiting to get everything started. And these are all people that own facilities, some like ours, and they have delivery trucks and, and different things. But they're on that call that day, one lady in California and one gentleman in Texas and another one in St. Louis, each one of them had a 7.3 gas Godzilla motor um, with cam delamination um, that they had had. And that's the big gas motor that Ford's got out there. But So I just took a second, and I, I looked online just to see what was out there. And, and like everything, if you want to find an article that talks about how these things are the biggest pile, of, you'll find it. Then you'll find somebody else that's being more reasonable and talking about how many were made and what the actual failure rates are. Yeah. But the article that really caught my attention, and I watched for about 10 minutes on YouTube, so I, I probably spent 15 minutes on this. They um, were just talking about, hey, this oil change interval uh, light on these trucks is not in the best interest of this engine. And you need to get that oil change more often. You need to make sure that oil grade is up. And a lot of fleets probably aren't hitting their oil change intervals. No, sure. And their use, if they're jumping out short runs to make deliveries or pick up vehicles or whatever it might have to be, might not be inducive to the life of that engine. So... That was something that I 
stumbled across this week, and it made me go, hmm. I know we sell those engines as soon as we get them, but it looks sounds like we got to be a little more careful how we inspect them to listen for the little pops in the tailpipe and things like that. I did some digging because I stumbled across this very thing this week. So I looked at it and I found several full videos coming out of dealerships that said, here we are with another 7.3 Ford gas engine with, and that was just on the Ford side. We had this on Chevy and Chrysler as well. But on the Ford side, I said, here's another one that has meticulous oil changes. We got a customer that says, I don't want to go by the factory change. I'm changing this every 3,000 miles. They had the engine apart and said, look at this. This thing's brand new. You could wipe it off and eat off the inside of this engine. There is no problem with oil changes, and we have documentation to show this, and we're fixing this under warranty, and here's a cam that's delaminated, and here's lifters. And they said, we have the same thing on our GM side and our Chrysler side with these cams. We've also seen it in remanufactured engines with any point of very high pressure. On the camshafts, the roller ones are better because they don't have near as much pressure as the flat tappet ones. Flat tappet ones are flat out coming apart on certain engines. Not every one, but some. It's not the manufacturer's fault. It's the metal maker's fault, the suppliers. This started happening about three years ago at the beginning of COVID. And the supplies were low. And all of a sudden they started coming up with some of the supplies. And in talking with some of the people that put these things together, they said, yeah, the, the quality of these is just not really good. It happened to me on the GMC Yukon, got the notice and Shannon's neighbor had one that was, we, we it was funny cause we talked about it. I wonder if his neighbor said, why did you talk about it? Cause that, I think it was that day or the next day they were asking you, Shannon, I had to have my vehicle towed in and they, they say it needs lifters. It was, so it was a pretty common thing, but now there were, there's a lot of them that don't have this problem. Uh, you know, we we had one that was like three in a row for a cam and a reman engine, but we put in another 20 of them with zero issues. So it's like, if you're going to get it, you, you get it. It's kind of like a, it's one of those things that it either hits you or it doesn't. So there seems to be some inconsistencies of, of the supply of materials to these manufacturers. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Darlene. You're on the end of the hood show. Darlene, what can we do for you? This is a wondering um, if we could have a choice uh, for home owners in America that has vehicles if they can um, turn Crisco oil, vegetable corn oil also into um, an engine un- under the hood engine of your vehicles because. Um, wouldn't that give us more uh, gasoline to turn the crude oil into gasoline if there was an abundance of um, Crisco oil, corn oil, vegetable oil that can be turned also into the engine? Um, it's cleaner. It's uh, not um, non-toxic. You mm-hmm. know, it's non-toxic to our system. And... I was wondering, would it do the same in our our engine? It's a good question. And this is actually, this almost goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the show when I said go back through the archives, because back 15 years ago, when gas prices started going up and we started talking about alternatives, this was something that people were experimenting Mm -hmm. with and doing. Yeah, so Darlene... Using um, vegetable oil, and I, I think you're meaning as an oil in your engines, you couldn't use just regular vegetable oil without some changing of the parts in the engine. But if you did, you could. But what has been done, anything you can make out of petroleum products, you can make out of corn, basically. With the biofuels industry... Well, and- Almost anything. It's just that corn is the most abundant, so that's what we. Right. Fo- I mean, so if you can, if you can use, let's say, crude oil and petroleum products to make engine oil, you can use soybean oil. You can use 
corn products, anything you can make in the biofuels industry, you can make with this. And they have made engine oil. It, it takes a little bit of, of doing to get it done. And it's not caught on quite as much as of course the ethanol industry has, but yes, it can be done. It is a clean product. It is renewable. You still have one problem though. If you take engine oil and you put it on the counter in a, in a plastic bottle and you put vegetable oil on the counter in the plastic bottle, there's a big difference between the two. You can cook your food with the clean vegetable oil in that plastic bottle. You cannot cook with the crude oil. Now, pour them both into an engine. Run that engine for a minute, turn it off, and drain it out. Now, neither one of those products can be used, again, as a cooking product because of all the contaminants that are now in that oil. So the recycling of it and the reuse of it becomes a different thing. It's, it's contaminated. Uh, ethanol going into a car, 100% ethanol going into an engine and running it, not, not mixed with gasoline all, but 100%, it goes in as a liquid, comes out as a carbon. The carbon's reabsorbed in plants, back into the earth, makes a cycle again. Takes a long time, but it does it. The crude oil gets pulled out, refined, burned through the engine, turns into carbon. It'll be returned through plant life, things like that, but it's never oil again. So it's not a renewable thing, although it is absorbed at some point. So the vegetable oil in an engine, I would look to see more renewable products in the crankcase in the future. And also engines now are, they're working very hard to change things like the top end of the engine, your lifters and things, changing those to electric solenoids with no oil in them to open them. So they don't require oil. This means in layman's terms, it's down to the you're keeping all the oil in the pan and you could need very little of it or none at all to, to run an engine if you had the right bearings and things. So uh, the less oil in the engine, the less time we have to, or the less often we have to change it, the better. But that's a great question. And I, I like that. Darlene, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Make a radio appointment each week to hear the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you watch us on YouTube or you check out our social media, sometimes uh, Russ will post some videos of stuff he's got going on in the shop. Short stuff. Yeah, One just like that. Hey, hey, I, here's was what impressed, we're doing. I was impressed at how many views some of those short little videos had yeah, like, mm-hmm. like 700 or something on a couple of well, them no and... there's some of them that have got thirty five thousand. Oh yeah those have been a while but i know like, but well, i was like wow doug's on producer doug on his prius you, you know i put that thing up and in like six hours it had 500 views or something. you sent us a, a video of producer doug's prius as you tore it, it apart it looked like uh, we've been fighting an air conditioning issue ever since the car was repaired it looked like i was walking in he's like oh here's a here's a video of Somebody walking into an office that's been vacated, and they used to have a full office in here, and they've left the building, yeah. and there's just wires sticking out of the wall. So uh, you're you're off the hook, by the way, on the Prius now because it's been 100 percent replaced. I <laughs> there was a uh, there was a we put another compressor on it because it had a problem with refrigerant oil in it that was not us. It was you know pre done, and it and it was causing compressor failures because you you can't mix electrically conductive refrigerant oil with not it's it's a Vegetable problem we found out that we found oil. out that it'll ruin the core yes <laughs> in a prius <laughs> yeah and and they're all electric compressors in them they're not run by a belt they're just like you're basically like a home a refrigerator that is one of the places where the high voltage system goes other than powering yes. the car is the air conditioning and the heating system so now that thing's beautiful but to get there along the way so doug started having a, a leak which is can happen in a Prius, but it's not super common. Luckily, yours hasn't, Chris. Otherwise, this would be going on. So I pulled the blower out and stuck a sniffer in there and went, beep, beep, beep. It's got a leak. 
I know I got to tear the dash out because I don't want to tear. The, I could, I could smell refrigerant, and I, I said, eh, I think it's leaking. But you know, you don't want to pull it out because it's a big job, and there is so many electrical connectors on a Prius. It's nightmarish. So I pulled the whole dash <laughs> it looked, out. It looked nightmarish. It looked <laughs> I, nightmarish. On this video short, I pulled it apart. I pulled the core out, held it in my hand, and it was soaked in refrigerant oil. It was it was bad. It leaking. So the, the, the video probably didn't do it justice from what you just said no, versus what I saw. It was wet. I mean, my hands were wet. It's like, this is gross. So put the new core in it, put it all back together to put the, replace the compressor and the condenser flushed everything that was left. And it's now a hundred percent correct. ND 11 oil and it's working and it's quiet and it's nice, but boy, now, how, how, many com- how many compressors have we put on that? Uh, this is the f- third one. And this, and this was all just related to a, a misstep in charging the refrigerant after it had an accident. Yep. The, it had, uh, before we had it, it had a new condenser put in it. So it had new oil put in it. And it uh, I don't know if you heard that. Uh, let's make it clear. Yeah. Someone else put the wrong. I, I yeah. may have heard that. If we did it, we, we still would have been, but we covered it. We, we took care of Doug. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's Doug. Um, yeah. So yeah, we put this thing together and put the condenser and the whole thing. Now it now it works good and and there's no leakage. So hopefully he'll never have to put refrigerant in this car again, as long as he owns it, anyways. But it's still got low miles. It's got like ninety seven thousand miles on, it, which is pretty low. So what else? What else happened during the repair? Yeah, that's yeah, what we, got, I was we got a, we got a minute or two here. <laughs> we got the part yeah. where you fixed it. <laughs> so in the beginning, when we got this car, it had an aftermarket remote start on there, and it was a a cheap one. It's, I think it says Canada start on it. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> you could put a cheap remote start in a Prius when yeah. it was integrated the system yeah. car. So it's tied in through the data system. Well, this thing had been running the, we found out later it was killing the battery. So we ended up instead of pulling the whole thing out, which would have required taking a bunch of panels off, I could get to it by pulling down a cover. And I said, well, I'll just pull the fuses out of it. I pulled the fuses out of it and stuck them in the pocket in this cover thinking, Maybe later I'll have to put them back in and I don't want to go digging for some fuses. So I'll just leave them there. Well, it fixed the problem and we forgot about it. That was about five, six, seven years ago, whatever it was. It's been a while. Yeah, I remember Doug complaining about, oh, the car's dead again. I mean, just... I think it was back like in 2015 because it was a couple years old as a 2012. So yeah. yeah. So yeah, he's like, I wish I had a remote start, but I don't need it that bad. So I left the fuses out. Well, the fuses ended up on the floor when I scattered everything and I went, oh, I better put those fuses back in the remote start. So I put them in, put the whole thing back together, and the vehicle wouldn't communicate, wouldn't work. So I spent half a day trying to figure out diagnosing the system. Why is it not working? And then I looked and realized, hey, we got a data wire tapped into the back of this communications port. It goes to that remote start. What happens if I disconnect that data wire? Because that thing's not working anyways. Pulled the fuses, took the data wire off, everything started working. And then I got to put my dash back together again because of this remote start that was broken in the first place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but now it works great. But the air conditioning is going to work all summer. Yeah. so <laughs> I It's going to work next summer. I sent Doug a text <laughs> saying, Doug, your car is ready, and then a link to a YouTube short. And I'm sure he went, what, what's this? And he clicked on it. It was like, Ugh, what happened to my dash? You got to make sure you drive it first and there's no rattles, because if you send somebody a picture of their dash or they oh, see it taken apart. Don't let them see it. They constantly think there's a rattle no, caused you, by your you dash. You don't want to see got, how the sausage is made in this there situation. There so many bolts in that dash. I've gotten that video rattle. before. Yeah, you don't, it's not one you want. Sometimes you just don't want to see it. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturtevants. Hour two is coming up. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. We are glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Hey, thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. While we were uh, starting up there and the music was playing, we had a call come in. Brian's been waiting a while. So let's talk to Brian. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Brian, what can we do for you? Uh, Oh. I've got a Buick with Sabre that will start and it, and it quits right away. Do you have any clue of what I could do to figure out how to get that to run? Um, I've taken it to a mechanic, and he cleared the codes off of it, and it had a history of codes and nothing current. And he cleared it off, and then he had it running, and he drove it around. And I took it home, and I got in to drive it and got, well, maybe an eighth of a mile from home, and it died. 
Do you have any idea what's going wrong there? While you were driving it down the road, it stopped on you, or was this when you came up to a stop sign? No, it, it'll it'll die when you have power on it. I this first started. I took it and I had to fill up with gas, and I filled up with gas, and I got to the station and went to get in. I started and it died, and I started again. It died, and then it was able to go. And I drove maybe two miles or so from the gas station. It died, and then it would act like it'd want to start, but it, it it'll crank and it'll it'll run for just a second, and then it'll it'll shut back off. And then and then I went to the mechanic, and he cleared the coats out on it. And then I took it home. I was going to drive it, and I, it it just acts like somebody shut the key off in it. Well, I'd sure like to know what those codes are. That's the mystery. <laughs> what were they when it died? Because if it had codes, it's a great way to lead mm-hmm. into what might have been wrong with it. Did we have a crankshaft position sensor code? Did we have a camshaft position sensor code in there? You know, those are very important things to know what's going on. We we always write those things down before we clear them so we can reference them later. Um, well, he is back at his shop. He hasn't worked on it yet, but I'm sure we can get it hooked up see what the code might be in it. Sure. Maybe you wrote them down last time. Well, Russell, just a quick question to throw in your thought process. Um, if he's cleared the codes, it's seldom on a car like that that clearing the codes is going to make it start versus not start. Oh, there's nothing that would yeah. make it start when you cleared the codes on that model. So vehicle. I don't think, I think clearing the codes did have anything to do with it starting. No. Anything. Because so. um, when I first took it to him, I, he told me, he said, unhook the mass sensor so i unhooked that well then we got it to run and then we unhooked the idle air controller and then it seemed like it was running run run good and then i took it home and then i hooked all that stuff back up and it was on the trailer i didn't even unhook it off the trailer and then it got off the trailer and then it died well, took it back to him and then he he said he cleared the codes and it was running and because he said something about maybe it was a security system in it, but they he said they didn't think it was that because the, the security light went off and it should have showed up in in the and it the security, security system thing. usually won't kill the car going down the road. If the security system fails, it allows you to continue on to where you're going to go, but then you'll have a problem on your next startup. Right, and this one controls the the cranking on this on this model vehicle. So, um, I don't know one. Yeah, that's still got that old system in there. So, but the mass if it's if you did not replace that mass airflow sensor, if you just unplugged it and then plugged it back in, those do have a habit. That and the map sensor, when they short internally, they can kill that car going down the road and keep it from starting as well. It'll crank, but it may not fire or it may fire and die. You can try to bypass those by unplugging that mass airflow sensor. You can even unplug the mass airflow and the map sensor together and crank it up. And it should, it'll idle. It won't run great, but it'll, it'll at least idle and start. You might have to hold the, the throttle down just a little bit, give it some fuel, give it some throttle there. Um, but... Yeah, a shortage sensor will do I, that for sure. I, I unhooked that mass airflow and the idle air control, and I tried to start it on my own. I, could, I still couldn't get it run. I could get it run at a shop, and then I took it home, like I said, and drove it, and it, it still, wouldn't, still wouldn't run off of that. I was just kind of trying to eliminate possibilities there of what, what might be going wrong with it. Yeah, the idle air control motor won't keep it from running even if it shorts out it'll still operate you can plug that back in but the the mass airflow c- could also those cars to get a fuel pressure gauge on it because the fuel pumps on those things they're known to just act weird they'll they'll run and then they'll just stop and your car will die and then you start them up again and they're fine and then they die they've I had a one in a Bonneville, which is the same O one Bonneville. I was just going to say, didn't you have a Bonneville that you drove like <clears throat> drove it for a week? And I, I finally got to, it would just one time it just died and then it started right back up as soon as I pulled over. So finally I put a voltmeter connected back probe right at the pump, ran the probes up front where I could see it in the front seat, hooked a fuel pressure gauge to it and drove this thing and noticed the car started, started acting up. And I looked at the, the meter and the meter said, battery it was like 14.2 i said i got battery voltage and power and ground right there at the pump it wasn't using external ground and i watched my fuel gauge and i noticed my fuel gauge was dropping down so if i've got a fuel gauge dropping down in pressure and i've got proper voltage the pump is junk i knew that for a fact so we put a pump in it and we were fine brian thanks very much for the call good luck yeah because the things on that car that would kill it going down the road are fuel 
Um, if your ignition module died, um, you know, you'd have that. And, and Russ mentioned a few times on the, the mass air and things like that, but even that usually doesn't kill the engine going down the road. It's usually something more significant in the, in the primary ignition system or the fuel delivery system to actually kill it going down the road. And worst case scenario, if he is getting a bunch of different weird codes and none of, and everything else looks good, you see an occasional bad computer in those, but that's not very often. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Jeremiah. You're on the end of the hood show, Jeremiah. What can we do for you? Uh, yes, sir. I've got a what would you do question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Depends on who you're asking. I have a, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a 2007 Toyota Sienna with 280,000 miles on it. Uh, it has an exhaust leak. The air conditioning sounds like somebody's put a baseball card in their spokes. <laughs> and it has an intermittent miss. Um, it may stutter once in an hour drive. It may stutter five or six times in a mile. Um, the Check engine light will flash three, four times, and then stop flashing. But it never goes off. Is it worth? I bought this car for three thousand dollars, eighty thousand miles ago. Is it worth fixing? Is it worth or is it? it going to cost Should he work as it? Much? <laughs> How many miles are on this vehicle now? Two hundred and eighty thousand. All right, well, 280, you're getting up there. You know, if you were to tell me this was an 07 Sienna that had 140 on it, I'd say go check the uh -huh. price of what they're selling for right now, and you're going to be shocked. And you're going to want to spend this money to fix it. Right. But with this many miles, it's probably, you know, it's probably got an issue with the with the coils and the spark plugs. Replacing right. those may, right. may and will hopefully get rid of your misfire issue with that flashing check engine light. Only if the engine isn't worn out, because three hundred thousand miles on a 07 Toyota Sienna could you you could have some issues inside. So I definitely, I don't know. I think I. What would be your process of checking this vehicle if they brought it in with these very questions? It was in your shop, and you're trying to give them an, an opinion of what you no. would do. What would what would be your steps? I'd forget about all the other stuff until I pull the spark plugs out, which I think I'm going to have to do anyways, and put some coils and plugs in it. Look at their condition, do a leak down test on it, make sure the cylinders are good. If While not, the plugs are out. Yeah. If they're not, just get rid of this fan. Then stop. It's at that many miles, it's not worth an engine. If it was 150, 180, maybe if the rest of the van was in good shape that you could put an engine in it. But at this point, if the van's still pretty good and you feel confident in driving, if it were running good, I would say we check the leak down. It's good. Probably going to need coils and plugs. Now, if it runs smooth and drives nice, then let's put the exhaust manifolds on because that's going to affect your drivability with the air getting into the oxygen sensors and things like that. And then you can go after the other stuff. Um, coils and coils and plugs, they, they really wear at that age on these. Oh, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, I, oh, I should probably add, this is a vehicle that I want to sell anyways, or uh, I want to upgrade. At this point, um, so with the miles that are on this thing, <laughs> If well, you've got then, some money saved mm -hmm. up for another one, instead of spending the uh, money to go after this and hope that maybe f I, I would be on the fence. I might just say, take whatever I can get for it from whoever, maybe sell put it, it as a mechanic special Facebook marketplace for 1200, 1500 bucks or something and just see what, see what, who bites. Yeah. The, the, I have to commend him though if it were me and i wanted to get rid of it and this was going on i would have that would be the perfect i wouldn't ask too many questions well i would uh, just be like hmm, chris hmm. we have a, a large number of customers that come to me with this very question and they say i want to get rid of this vehicle i want to buy another one. Oh, it's going to cost me four thousand bucks to fix it yes well i don't want to spend that money i'll put it on something else and i'll just scrap this one for 300 bucks and then i say wait a second do you know what this vehicle's worth running well, I've seen a few of them out there selling for fourteen, fifteen thousand. Then why would you get rid of it when you could put that money into it and sell it or even get the trade-in value out of it? And some of them, about half and half, will say, yeah, I'll fix it. And the other one will say, I don't want to mess with it. I'm ready to move on. Yep. And they just sell it, you know. But you've got to look at it. It's like a stock investment. you got to look at it and say, if I put this much money in, 
how much money am I going to get out guaranteed? And you can get a guarantee on a car to a point. I just ran a quick search. What do you think 07 Siennas are going for with uh, 150,000 miles? Uh, $8,900. $8, Seven grand. Seven grand. 285,000 miles. There's a couple 200,000 vehicles here for five grand. Five grand. The, the used car prices are coming down, but there's certain there's segments still, that are still yeah. strong, and Toyotas always hold their value well. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the End of the Hood Show. Car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Scott. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Scott, what can we do for you? Yes, hello. Are you in a boat, Scott? What's going on where you are? uh, Well, not much. It's a little chilly. Uh, I have an O2 Buick LeSabre. My uncle does, I guess, not me. Uh, on the EVAP system, the vent line from the tank to the canister, do they have a liquid check valve in there like Nissans do or not? So gas can't get into the canister? No. They got a rollover valve in the tank if you roll the car over that prevents fuel from. Well, it tries to prevent fuel from spilling out the top of the tank, but as far as a, no, there's not, you fill that thing. If you don't stop at the first click, fuel is going to come out of the tank and it's going to make its way right into the canister and the vent valve and kill it. He's been, he's been having problems for a couple of years. So I feel it for him and I'll, I'll, when I fill it, I'll listen for it, and you can hear when it's getting near, you know, mm-hmm. before it shuts off. I shut it off then. Yeah, and if, if you've got a canister that's already contaminated, sometimes it'll go a little longer before it, it shuts off. Uh, that's neat how some cars do that. I was just thinking about that yesterday. I was filling up my truck, and the pump was really slow. And I'm thinking, how, many, how much fuel did I have in this? Was, was it low? I can't remember. And all of a sudden, I hear a boom, and I went, oh. It's going to click off very quickly because it makes this loud, poop, like a pop can, and it's loud because it's full of fuel, but it does that just right before it shuts off the thing. And some of these cars too, I, you can hear air rushing out of the vent right where you're filling it just before it clicks off, mm-hmm. which tells you it's getting up there. Scott, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. I also noticed, as probably everybody mentioned to you in one of the latest magazines, the cars they're looking forward to. One of them was the 25 Z28. That was the end end, end end run of the Camaro. For for the internal combustion Camaro. Mm -hmm. They said that there's a possibility that, of course, they'll maybe come with an electric. I hope they do a little more justice to the Camaro than they did to the Mustang. I don't know. I'm still kind of. Not sure about that. On the way out? Yeah, well, just what... Oh, you mean the, the, a four-door Camaro? The name that they affixed oh, the Mustang yeah. to after... But they're still doing the other Mustangs. Right. So that's different. That is... Mm-hmm. I, I was just having this conversation with someone the other day about the Mustang mach and should they have and why did they and... And I... I I still think it was a great marketing plan. I think it was a great marketing plan because it got people talking about if they had called it just the mach or anything but a Mustang, most people would have gone, oh, they have an EV? Oh, okay. It would have made a a dent in the numbers, Chris. If you never called it the Mustang, people that own one right now would have never paid attention to it and not bought it. I think they haven't sold a lot of them. And most, but (laughs) well, they did though for a while. They've they've sold them, but not, there's no runaway freight train at the time. It almost, I mean, they were out for a long time. They didn't make very many. There's a couple of them in Garrettson now. Mm -hmm. And seeing them every morning. And I think most of the stuff that you read about it or saw, even including us was, "Ah, I'm not going to, well, it's actually okay. But we liked it when we drove it. Yeah, it it was fun. That's what I mean. When Sioux Falls Ford let us drive that for an afternoon, that was a good car. And if they had called it the ES257, we would have never driven it. We just wouldn't, it wouldn't have hit our radar. We wouldn't, yeah, we may not have known it existed. Yeah. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Kurt. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Kurt, what can we do for you? Well, I'd like to thank you for your show. It's wonderful. I called you 
earlier this winter, I had a 94 Ford pickup, 302 automatic that's shifting erratically. You guys gave me some pointers. And I wanted to touch back with you. What it ended up being was, uh, I mentioned it to you, I pulled the computer. As soon as I opened it up, I knew I had trouble. It had five components wrong with it. I took it to a speedometer shop in uh, Winona, Minnesota, and he fixed it right up for me. The capacitors, three capacitors, a transistor, and there was one other component was bad in it. But he fixed it up. It was like 150 bucks. And it shifts perfectly now. You, so I, I got to go back. You said when you opened it up, you noticed right away. Could you see something wrong with it when you opened it? Yeah, I could see. I could see the capacitors were leaking on it. So I knew I had trouble, and I was an instrument tech in a power plant. So okay, da a little extra tech. knowledge there. What to look for? If yeah. the cap- I, mm, I wonder if the battery was ever hooked up backwards in this vehicle at some point, and it, it just overloaded those things oh, because cooked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I've had it for uh, ten years now. That pickup, I bought a second hand, but I pulled the tranny a couple years ago, and I took it to a. It, the torque converter was weak. So I took it to a guy, and he went through it, a known transmission guy here. And after that, it was all over the place. It just was radically. And I took it back to him. He said he didn't do nothing wrong with it. So I've been kind of chasing this problem, and I called you folks. I think you guys wanted me to change out the radiator, maybe, just when it's been plugged. Or the, I think it's the TR, the new safety switch. Yeah, transmission range sensor on it, probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you mentioned. Because mine's got the 70 transmission in it. Yep, 4R70W. So yep, the yeah. electronic. And they had some issues with those with the uh, the manual lever position switch on the side. Radiators, we do talk about those now and then if somebody has an overheating transmission. Once it drives, you get up to operating temp or you're towing and it, it it's erratic when it's at temp. A lot of times it's overheating and yeah, you'd want to change a radiator for that. I'm kind of curious. The this is gonna play. I'm going to play the small world game. The gentleman that you brought that computer to to fix it, was his first name David? I can't tell you. It was a really nice older gentleman. He has stuff stacked to the ceiling. <laughs> pretty sure, I, I'm pretty sure I know who it is. No patch on his shirt? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm pretty sure I know who it is. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Really nice gentleman. Oh, super nice, you, super nice gentleman. And he's in a real super inexpensive and just treated me really great. I was just, I was just happy as heck. That's well, cool. Thanks for the call, Kurt. How many, how many customers come in and say, I took the computer out and I opened it and it looks like I need three resistors. And I say, good for you. Let's get you a computer. <laughs> now, right. why did they go out? Yeah. Well, because I, we I'm don't telling see you, this. I'm telling you though, your question is, is the answer you want to hear is the truth. Very few. Right. Yeah. This is because normally they this is a would, Kurt special. Normally they wouldn't be at his shop if they already knew how to take the computer apart. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I just yeah. How many how many computers are just sitting on a heap somewhere that are just one? It's just the one thing that just needed a resistor. I got all those computers on the that were stacked up fixed <laughs> yeah. now. Oh, they haven't sold any of those in twenty years. Hmm. Yeah, it's not an. I don't think it's an ongoing business uh, concern to be able to fix that ninety four resistor. Although it actually doesn't do too bad. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us eight six six five nine four four one five zero. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. If you follow us on Facebook and you join the Hoodie Fan Club, you could win a hoodie. Like Kent Milstead, congratulations from all of us here under the hood and our friends over at Universal Institute. Universal Technical Institute. Universal Technical Institute. UTI.edu. Yeah, that's the one. Mm-hmm. It's where you go to that. learn stuff. And you do good learning it's stuff. Getting to be, uh, it's getting to be boat season. If you uh, if you went there for marine mechanics, you're you're just swimming in money right now. You got it all just piled up, and you're just jumping in like Scrooge McDuck. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. Let's talk to Arnold. You're on the end of the hood show. Arnold, what can we do for you? 
Hey, how you doing, man? Doing all right. Thank you for taking the call. You bet. I can I just want to let you know I came across y'all on a on a prison podcast in in the state of Florida. Huh? And I decided now I've been released. I've decided to get in stay in contact with y'all. I heard some good things about y'all. So that's ah, cool. Thank we got you very on, much. We're on quite a few of them now. They got they put us on the here in this state. They put us on the list of approved podcasts to listen to in the in the system. So now we're on a lot of places. Well, that's great. I appreciate right, I appreciate you. your call and, and knowing that uh, you're going on to your next step and 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 keep it keep it solid. What what's up today? I have a '99 Marquise. Um, I've replaced the fan the, the cooling fan system three times, and as soon as I replace it and put on new relays, new connectors, new wires, new fan itself, new motor, and as soon as the, the engine tells the fan to turn on, it'll kick on in two seconds. It'll do that. And two seconds later, it cuts off just yeah, like he did. Just like that, yeah. I'm guessing that's what he was going to say. Uh-huh. Oh, we lost it. He actually, the cell dropped there. Oh, no. Oh, he'll he'll come back, so we should just Should we hold on to that one? Let's should, just put that on hold. Hang on, because then we don't have to answer it twice. Right. We can get him hooked up. Okay. You know, that 99 Marquise makes me think of a, of a, a call we got off air on the show from a wonderfully nice lady, uh, Betty Greisel, or Grisel? Greisel. And uh, she wanted to know, she had heard us talk about something or say something in regards to an 07 Lincoln Town car. And so I talked to Betty on the phone. I called her and gave, gave her some time because she deserved it. 90 years old, um, living on her own. And she moved here from California to our part of the world five years ago because her family was here. Uh, exchanged some real estate, still has rental property. A very, very nice lady. Grew up on a dairy farm, um, and in in uh, south of uh, California, uh, south of Southern California, and put herself through real estate school while raising kids. As a youth, she re- she survived. Um, what fever was it that was back? Uh, the Spanish flu. No room. <laughs> um, Oh, I can't. But anyway, it it was a very scarlet fever. No, no, no. I rheumatic, rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever. fever. Rheumatic fever. And she was down for six months as a I wasn't as a alive teenager. Back then, maybe you. And just I mean, such she just had COVID two years ago and made her way through that. Still got non gray hair. I just enjoyed talking to her. And so I did her a favor, and I I said she had a car she wants to sell, and her 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 kids and stuff and grandkids can help her sell it. I said, you know what? Let me come down and take a look at your car. You're not far from me. I don't do this. It's not a thing that I do, but I drove down to her house and I, I spent uh, 15, 20 minutes just chatting with her and looking at her car. And she has got, and it was her and her husband's and he's passed away now, but a, just a beautiful 07 Lincoln town car, rear wheel drive, uh, signature series limited with only 60,000 miles on it. And it's got, some little scratches here and there where it's been abrased a couple times and in the garage, it's gotten scratched a few times, a little dent on the roof, but what a nice solid car. And so she was asking me the very question we talked about on other things. What is this thing worth? Mm -hmm. And so I started poking around on the internet and I found out the same thing is that you can find those cars for sale for $5,000 and you can find a pristine 80,000 mile car that they're asking $14,900 for because mm-hmm. that was the last years of that big rear wheel drive, full frame, cruising down the highway, floating down the road, Lincoln town car. So she's going to be trying to sell that. And, and, uh, I think I gave her some good advice, but if anybody's looking for a nice big Lincoln, <laughs> I could give you the phone number, okay. and, and, but she's not giving it away because she knows her game. She is, <laughs> she's done real estate. She's done huge transactions. She's, She's not, uh, she just wants to sell it for what it's worth to somebody and not, and not have somebody take advantage of her. And she's like, she's, I'm not going to let that happen. I said, no, I don't think you are. <laughs> 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Raymond. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Raymond, what can we do for you? Well, we, uh, this is uh, that post, our post, Legion post in uh, Newtown, North Dakota. And there's uh, a nursing home in town that's uh, a spray about a, a Chevy 14 passenger uh, express van or, or a bus and uh, gave it to him in 2012. Okay. And a few years later, the nursing home closed and they didn't know what their, so the, the bus was sitting 
for a few years, and then they got all this lady again and, and asked her if, uh, what they should do with that bus after they closed. And she, so anyway, she donated it to our Legion post. And it had uh, 2,500 miles on it. That's been probably in about 2020 or 21. So it sat for quite a while. So we took it up to Chevy Garage and mine it, and it had uh, that it still had bacon oil in it, and uh, changed the oil, and then they uh, swapped the injectors because we figured that the injectors probably were sitting so long, probably so deep to the clean, and everything was fine until about a month or so a little bit more ago. Uh, we took it up to my head again, just uh, had something to do, and the check engine light came on, and so I had was these old testers, and and uh, the, it came up with a right and left bank running lean. And then I cleared it, and then in a little while, run it for a while, and about, see, like, about 50 miles, and the engine light gets, comes back on again. And then I wasn't here, but they run some uh, gas, some winterized uh, gas treatment in there. For, you know, for free, for... Uh, yep. Sure. Ice hole or some ice hole or whatever. And anyway, and he, they said they put a pretty good dose in there. And I was just wondering if that had anything to do with that, with uh, running lean on the bank. What would affect that? Because that really happened after they run the, run the ice hole through there. And we've been run, running premium gas in there, too, un, unleaded uh, premium. So the vehicle itself is super low miles. It's sat for a long time. Um, you know, that express van chassis uses a pretty proven 6.0 liter or 5.3 liter. Or actually, that one would be either a 6.0 or a 4.8 uh, engine, you know, in there. And it's a pretty common engine for us to see. And so the problems that come up are common to the pickups and to the everything in that era. And... Simply running the gas line antifreeze or or some sort of a treatment through there should not have caused the lean codes or anything like that. Unless you put a whole bunch in there, it will, because it's alcohol. Like half a tank. It, too much. Well, you, you would have had to put a lot in there, but if you put, you know, if they put five or six bottles in there, and some people do, I don't know why, but they do that, yeah, it could cause a lean code. So would you... Russ, would, you, would your suggestion be just to run that tank down as long as it's not a flashing check engine light, run that mm-hmm. tank down to a half a tank and then fill it up with some fresh premium fuel yeah. and then just keep running it a little bit? I will tell you, I don't think they had to put new injectors in there. That that's a, We have engines that sit for a long time, and occasionally we will get a sticky lifter or a sticky uh, fuel injector. I said, if I said, did I say fuel injectors? Yeah, a, a sticky fuel injector, but you you can sometimes get them out of it and just replace the one that's bad or the two that are bad, but that's okay. I mean, they, it, it, they wanted to be extra careful because of the, the respect of the people that it's going to be working mm. with. I mean, yeah. it, I don't want people from the Legion having a vehicle breakdown. Right. All respect to the people involved in the community. And, and a lot of times there's veterans involved. Um, you know, we want to, we want to show the respect and make sure that thing's going to work. Kids fine. You they, got, they, they got can, time to waste. They can walk a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think you need to do that, and I think I think you'll be fine. I really do. I think you'll be good to go. Make sure they change. Russ, does that one have an external fuel filter on an express van chassis like that? I don't know for sure if it's in the tank or where it's at. But on a twelve, no. Yeah, it, just have them check that if it has an external filter. Make sure they change that too. So that's that's the course I would take. Raymond, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Eight six six five nine four four one. Five oh, let's talk to JJ. You're on the end of the hood show. JJ, what can we do for you? Hey, good morning. Um, got a Honda CRV 2012, 165,000 miles. The windows don't go up and down. Um, we tried the fuse. Um, doesn't seem to be the fuse. So, any ideas? Oh boy, both windows stopped. Yeah, none of the none of the windows go up and down and. A friend of mine has a um, Honda Pilot 2008, I believe. But he has some type of module go out in the dash where they had to take the dash out, and actually it was about six, seven hundred bucks to 
I, I, I guess I've never heard of that in a Honda, but um, you're probably talking about body control module. But if they all quit together like that, the most likely culprit is going to be the wires in the in the door jam. In one of them, probably okay. in the driver's side front door, there's a tube that goes through their little plastic thing that where the wires run through. And as that door moves in and out, it, it bends the wires enough. They break, they get brittle, especially on one that's okay. had a lot of entry, you know, in and out city cars and stuff like that. But I, I check that first, I, you know, you could pull the switch mm-hmm. out and get yourself a cheap voltmeter and see if you've got voltage at the switch. If you don't, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good indication. Did, have you lost the the power mirrors on the switch too. Have you tried that? The mirrors work fine. Okay. Um, I have to kind of give you more information, I guess, because not this Easter, but last Easter on Good Friday, I was going up to Aberdeen, hit a deer. Um, my nephews work at um, a Honda dealership up there uh, in Auto Body, do a great job. And I told them that my windows weren't going down and I've been so busy with work that I just that one dealt with it. Um but um and it's your I think your thinking is right because it maybe in that accident when I hit the deer um going up to Aberdeen there might have been something that just got pinched and um you know and then it just stopped and it sounds like I have a brother that's a Honda mechanic that's um, up there too, so he can. I'm sure they can diagnose it. It's just, yeah, I would have him diagnose the wiring and just double check that, and then I'd send the bill to the deer. Yeah, he drove home on Sunday. Deer was gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Easter joke for you there. Yeah, Shannon, I, I you, didn't you, catch on right can, away. Oh, <laughs> no, I didn't. JJ, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. <laughs> you there now? All right. Yeah, I yeah. did. I didn't catch that right away, but that was good. <laughs> Prepare to learn something. You're going under the hood. 866-594-4150. Welcome back to the Under the Hood show. What's caught uh what else has caught your attention? Oh, uh, so I was driving home last night and I looked over. There was a car behind me and I said, "Oh, that's the Trans Am I like, the newer body style that has two headlights." In each pop-up headlight, not just, I don't like the ones with the one. I like the dual. 98 through 02. I like this cool. <laughs> so then it hit me. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on a second. Did then you say the newer? You did say the newer. The newer Trans Am okay. because after that, gone. Sure. Yeah, 02 is the end. So. When did Pontiac end? 02? No, no. Seven? Mm, no. no. 27? 48? 64? <laughs> I don't I, know. <laughs> Oh, nothing is, to do you're, with this. I'm embarrassed. I can't spit this out right away. I'm gonna say it was after it was uh, uh, ten. I know eleven. I think it was two thousand. They made a vibe. Chris is gonna look they it made up. a vibe up until two thousand ten. Oh, was it ten? I think Pontiac ended nine, nine or though. ten, and then they had. Can I just jump in and say yes. we're not that ignorant? It's just that time is so fluid these days and we just forget that you think oh it was three years ago i should get this one you should i but should get this when one. you, you work on less of them stuff i i think it's i think it's nine so you saw this trans am i'm intrigued yeah. you got and my i'm attention. looking and it was raining so the headlights were on that's how i knew it had the dual headlights i was like all right there we go i wasn't thinking about what year it was didn't really care i just went oh that's cool and then it hit me i went hey we're doing a show tomorrow i'm gonna ask the guys when was when and what was the last american-made car with pop-up headlights, whether oh. it was Ford, General Motors, or you know, that's people. actually a, yeah. This I, this 1988 question, Fiero, and the Trans Am has them. Oh, duh! You just said that, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So and I, and it was hitting me because <laughs> I and, and this question I came to up. Go hard to justify my we're not ignorant. Comment. I was going <laughs> to ask you guys this we ten years ago. This this came to me ten years ago in the same situation, and I saw a Corvette with pop-up headlights. Yeah, Eighty-four and I said, Corvette. So. No, it was newer than that. So uh, that's right. They went to, the, to two thousand two C four. So yeah. when when what was it? 
it was it the so and you can't say Mazda Miata. That's a different car. But um, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler. When was the last? And what was it? It had to have been either the Pontiac or the Corvette. What Did you look last? it up? No. Okay. Not yet. All right. I, I think it would be a, an old four Corvette. I have all of the answers that you guys want. No, Trans Am is newer than that. No, O2, they stopped the Trans Am. Yeah, so oh, did you think it was 2004 Corvette? Yeah, because then they went to O5 was the was the the closed headlight generation. Can was I just say, when we, when we have phone issues or we don't have calls, this is what you get on the Under the Hood show. So Yeah, That's please right. call. Please call. Yeah. All right, I have all the answers. Because I'm, we should point out too. You guys still don't use computers. Sometimes during the break, no, that's why I don't know this answer. You get they, on your phones and they do had a stuff. Montana van SV6, but that was like stopped in 07 or eight too. A Montana van had pop up headlights. No, no, no. I'm talking about for the Pontiac question. I'm oh. trying to. I'm still. I'm on that one yet too. You just tell me when you're ready. I got them both. Okay, do I'm, I'm going to stay with the Pontiac vibe or the Pontiac being the last. What year? I'm changing my. 10. I'm changing my year. Nine. 2011. Ten. 11. You're going 11. Yep. You're going 9 or 10. 10. I'll stand 10. 10. The answer on Pontiac is 10. The final car was a 2010 G6. Now, oh, it was the darn G6. Yeah. We watched it on the yes, assembly line. We rolling did. Off. We, they actually sold that car at auction, too. Uh-huh. And the last American made car with pop up headlights, the 04 Chevy Corvette. You are. You were kind of on a roll there. It took you a while to get there, uh, but you got there. There was a lot of processing going on yeah, there. Yeah, there was a lot going on there. I had a. I used to have a Triumph. I've had many Triumph TR7s over the years and a couple TR8s. And the headlights, when they were down, you could pull the stock back for flash to pass, and they would pop up. But they weren't quite in unison. So if you <laughs> if you pulled it back, one would come up and the other one would come up too. But they were just like a fraction of a second behind each other. But if you would let off it and pull it about the speed of a blinker, like ding, 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 they would they would start waving at you. <laughs> one would come up, the other one would go down. I've had go, that before on Fieros, and, yeah, and, and they would go back and too. forth. So I would just drive down the road sometimes doing that, and they would when and they don't come on until they're all the way up on those. So it would come up and light up, and then the other one would go down. So they go blink, blink. Next blink. thing you know, you're in a gang. Just people you, like, what are you doing? A, <laughs> you gave yeah. us you gave us signal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I had a conversation the other day with uh, someone who listens to the show, uh, but not close enough to know that I don't know anything. So they think I, oh yeah, you're on the end of the hood show. I have a question for you. You're the secret weapon. Yeah, I get that a lot. I get that like, oh, you, you'll know this answer. I'm like, oh boy, you, you should listen closer. Uh, And they said, uh, we were talking about the styles of cars and how they were talking about their, how come cars don't have the body edges anymore like they used to and I, and I was able to answer that a lot of that went away because of pedestrians the, what the oh don't that's how you don't want sharp edges to cut people there are that's the design i don't want an oldsmobile rocket on the front of my car anymore the design <laughs> hood ornaments is that a tattoo no it's a it's a brand hood <laughs> ornaments and in america and in europe but in america a lot there are the angles of the body lines on cars are very strict and can't be sharp. I thought they were for aerodynamics. Mm-mm. Well, that too. That they, too. they play it all together yeah, once for they, sure. But they had to follow that standard. <laughs> but yeah, they they have to. Wow. And then because I and then I read a thing about how there was at one point a discussion. They tried to have a discussion about the material that it's made of, and even a sharp edge on a car made from. Uh, fiberglass or plastic wouldn't be as damaging as a, but yeah, that is a big, big part the of it. Front bumpers are very soft now. And that was, well, and well, then they, they also, thought they, I was a genius. They also though. had complaints from the BDSOA. What's that? The Buck and Doe Society of America. <laughs> That's right. The they they, they got like, together and said, hey, these hurt. Uh-huh. We, we need something smoother to roll off of. So. Let's talk to Jordan. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Jordan, what can we do for you? Hey, how are y'all doing today? Fantastic. Oh, I just wanted to say I'm a huge fan of the show. You guys are doing great. And I was just curious about um, hydrogen engines and if there's any new developments in that or I guess the way that motors and the news is going, like EVs and hydrogen. What do y'all think about all that? Or Interesting. Interesting I, question because it's come up in the magazines recently Shannon's with Toyota. Shannon's probably got some stuff. I'm, I'm curious about running. I, I'd kind of like to run my diesel engine in my truck on ethanol. 
they're doing that with some diesels now. And especially with my older one, I'd be able to do some stuff with it. But this hydrogen stuff. Well, there's a couple of folks that have taken on the hydrogen car. Um, the, there's a couple of ways. Look, you can have a hydrogen cell vehicle that's producing, using hydrogen power to produce electricity mm-hmm. to basically run an electric vehicle. So instead of having a huge storage battery, you've got a hydrogen cell gener- you know, that generates power. And then they also have folks that are actually taking hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, and, and they're bringing it into a, an ICE engine and run. And that's what we talked about earlier with the, the chairman of the previous chairman of Toyota. Mm-hmm. He had taken one out, set up like that, and they, they found the injectors that would work and they've figured it out to run. And they have a production vehicle that runs on hydrogen. Correct. And in the magazines that we read a lot, Car and Driver, Motor Trend, and other ones, they took off on a cruise with a hydrogen powered Toyota Mira? Mirai. Mir- Mirai, how are they saying it? I don't know yeah. how they say it, but we know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And they, the, their long-term test was that people liked the car. They liked the way the car drove, but there was definite issues on the filling, filling. station filling station availability and consistency. Of and, all of the filling stations in America, all but one are in California. Yeah. There was only one outside of California. Yeah, and so it was really not a viable vehicle unless you lived near those Mm -hmm. filling stations. But there is, I think in the heavy truck world, there's a lot of investigation going on with hydrogen. And it's just going to be interesting. I I don't know that the hydrogen internal combustion engine is going to get there. That'd be my opinion. Maybe write that one down and I'll be completely wrong. But it just doesn't seem like that's, I think we're going to skip that step. I think there's people going to do it to prove concept Mm -hmm. and show other ideas that can be done. There's also these new fuels that are being made that are, you know, carbon free and different things to run an internal yeah, combustion e-fuel engine. That Porsche's been working. Exactly. With. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. But um, hydrogen is the most intriguing because it's the most available supply. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you could figure out how to get that economically in, introduced into the supply chain, building the infrastructure is going to be the big issue on that one, probably. For sure adoption getting it out all right that'll do it for this hour of the under the hood show thanks for listening until next time you can find us at under the hood show.com don't forget you can watch the show on youtube subscribe comment like our posts we would love it thanks for joining us for the under the hood show